Okay. Well, um, I'll go slow at the beginning in case we have people come and join us late. Um, since you're kind of a smaller audience and these fonts are smaller than I would have liked them to be given the video format, if you want to sit close enough to the screens that you can see them and, you know, I'll do better. Um, so hopefully you're in the right place. Uh, we're going to talk about how not to measure latency. Uh, this is a, a talk I've been developing over the last year or so, um, mostly trying to relay some of the hard gained wisdom that we've gotten from uh, measurement of actual systems, actual latency in the field in lots of different situations. And um, both the mistakes that we made a lot, mistakes we see other people make, and, and hopefully we'll be able to talk about them to a point where some of them will get repeated. Um, when, when I talk about measuring latency in general, um, it's always in some context. And as we go through the talk, I'm going to cover a few things. Uh, the beginning would be just some background about latency, um, how people tend to think about it, um, what's wrong about how, how a lot of people think about it, and uh, some of the common pitfalls around how people use statistics to describe latency behavior and how often misuse them. Um, we'll get into some philosophical questions of why we measure latency to begin with. What is the purpose? What is the reason? And it varies across different systems. And then we'll look at some specific deep dive problems. There's a specific problem I see repeated in almost all cases that I've seen so far of measurement of response time, latency, transaction times. Uh, that I call the coordinate admission problem. It's a way that people successfully lie to themselves and to their business and end up with uh, results that are measured that are far from reality. Um, so we'll get into the detail of that some and I'll demonstrate actual measurements from actual places and what they look like. Um, we'll then look at some tools. Uh, I've spent a bunch of time in this space and I've built actually some tools that I put up on GitHub and open source that are useful for both establishing measurements, uh, correcting for things like coordinate admission and plotting results as a baseline or as a sanity check against your other tools. So we'll talk about those some. And then um, I'm going to use those tools to brag a little. And you'll see what I mean when I get there. Um, so a little bit about me. Um, my name is Gil Tene. I'm the CTO of Azul Systems. I'm one of the co-founders there. And I've been at Azul for about a decade now, a little over a decade. Yes? Volume. You guys can see the screens okay? Okay, so hopefully the font's not too small. I apologize. I, um, I think the video format, they asked to do the widescreen and it kind of shrinks everything, so, yeah. Is the volume better now? Good. Thanks. So, um, one of the things that I've been working on a lot in the last decade or so has been garbage collection. It's one of the fortes of what we do at Azul Systems. Um, and, and I've been looking or working on different ways than the typical ones in the industry and garbage collection for a while. This is um, some evidence of me actually working on garbage collection. Um, it's, uh, for you, those of you who don't know what that device is, it's actually a trash compactor. Um, it's a broken trash compactor. Fragments are coming out the back. Um, and, and I actually had to work on it, so I took the opportunity to take the garbage collection book out and take a picture with it. This dates back to 2004, so you can see how long I've been working at it. Um, but I've, I've built a lot of different things, everything from virtual machines to operating systems, uh, worked in kernels a lot in real-time systems and drivers, uh, helped design hardware, um, built telco systems and firewalls and switches and routers and played in a lot of different parts, including you know, subscriber management systems for millions of subscribers and telco environments for broadband, so mostly written in Java at a time where we had to build our own app servers. So I've played with a lot of different parts of the software stack, and I have a lot of scars on my back to show for it. 
Um, and, and this latency measurement part is something that, you know, over the years I've, I've done a lot of testing and performance testing and tuning, but especially in the last few years as we've been selling our product that focuses on latency and performance and response time consistency, we've learned a lot about how people measure and not measure. Azul, where I come from, uh, it's pretty simple. We focus on building scalable virtual machines, Java virtual machines, and we've been doing that for a decade. Our approach has been pretty much to do whatever it takes to do that, and whatever it takes included some very interesting things. Uh, we built three generations of custom multi-core hardware. Something's wrong with my build there. It's supposed to be bigger than that. <laughs> That's the shrunk down version of a 16 chip, 864 core SMP machine that we built. We built three generations of this hardware and a virtualized JVM to that uses a pauseless garbage collection within it. And um, we did that but out about, up to about four and some years ago, at which point we recognized that uh, Intel and AMD x86 roadmap is getting so good that we don't have to build our own hardware anymore. And that the things that we used to require um, custom hardware for to achieve can now be done on commodity platforms. Um, with that, we basically converted to using Zing. And Zing is a software JVM, runs on Linux, x86, commodity platforms, and has a collector we call the C4 garbage collector that is basically a pause-free collector. Um, we're known for low latency, for consistent execution, response time. You'll see the relation to what we're measuring here. And for large data sets and, and large heaps uh, when people need them. So let's talk about latency. A little bit about how pe assumptions people make in this field that are false and that often when they, even when they know they're false, uh, affect the way they measure and affect the way they interpret results. The first one is people tend to assume that computers tend to run nonstop, that they run continuously, and, and that it's a smooth kind of execution environment. Things run at the same rate, and if there's any kind of variance to behavior, it's usually the processing that takes longer or shorter. Uh, the reality is that computers stop and they stop all the time. They stop at you need any two instructions, they stop for interrupts, they stop for context switches, they stop for all kinds of things, including garbage collection and load, they might stop for power management, and all those things have huge effects on latency um, that are often ignored, especially when you do things like averages. Um, response time uh, is often measured by people by taking a throughput saturated system saying how many transactions per second am I doing? Well, the response time is, you know, the time divided by that. And that's a good average transaction or average response time during saturation, but response time generally can't be measured this way, at least not in a way that's interesting. Um, there's a common fallacy around the distribution of latency. The, the assumption or more like the wishful thinking where people would like latency to have some sort of a normal distribution so that we can extrapolate from very few data points what the overall behavior is like. We would like to think that there's an average. We would like to think that things spread around the average in some now nice Gaussian distribution that, that falls off to the sides. And we'd like to think that there are measurements like standard deviation that actually describe what that behavior is like. That's a total fallacy in software latency. Um, the last one, and we'll see how big this one is, is that glitches or interruptions that are semi-random or happen in once in a while in our actual measurement have no real effect on the quality of those measurements. <clears throat> and the reality is that if you have truly uncoordinated interruptions, sampling should be okay. But whenever there's any kind of coordination, uh, we see a lot of effects on what latency looks like and how latency characterization how it looks like once those interruptions are in place. And I'll give you specific examples of that as we go. Um, so all those things are wrong, and we'll, we'll touch on each as we go, but let's look at how people have looked at latency and load and response time over decades. This uh, chart is from an IBM Kix manual, so it's kind of old. I'm not sure exactly how many decades old. 
Um, but it's a classic view of how response time behaves under load. It starts off good, very good, and as you increase the load, it gets a little bit worse, and at some point it crosses from good to acceptable to not being acceptable. And, and we all have this intuition that as we increase the load and what we ask of a system, it's starting to creak and queue and wait and things like that. that. That is a good intuition in general. But when we look at this to characterize response time, there are a few key assumptions here and a few key questions to ask. The first one is, what do we mean by response time? Do we mean the average? Do we mean the worst case? Do we mean the 90th percentile? Which response time are we asking about? We have a million transactions. How do you want to describe that? What is it that I'm plotting? And most likely people are plotting the average. That's the most typical one they do. Um, but the average is not something businesses need. There are very few businesses that can tell you, I want an average response time of something. They typically have a requirement that the response time be at least as good as or should never be worse than, or I'm okay with it being worse than once in a while, but it better be really rare. Half of your things being terrible is usually not a good business requirement. Um, so that's a good example of where averages tie into those assumptions. But look at the other part, there's another key assumption here, and that is that latency is a function of load. And that is that the, that the primary thing that affects latency behavior is load. So as we grow the load, it'll get worse. As we shrink the load, it'll get better. There's this flat area where it's pretty good, and it's not really sensitive to load. So let's look at some example measurements. I actually went to the web and downloaded, searched for response time graphs and downloaded some to look for interesting things. This is an example of a response time chart. The source is quoted down at the bottom. Um, I don't, hopefully you guys can see this well enough. There are two interesting lines on this chart. There's a jagged dark line with peaks, and there's a very light blue line that goes from a low number at the left to a high number at the right. The light blue line is the load. That's the user count in this specific case. Um, and yes, as that user count grows, the bottom of the dark line does tend to grow with it. So there is some relationship between latency and load here. But it's pretty clear that that's not the dominant cause of latency. Um, we have these interesting ups and downs that have nothing to do with the load, a lot more to do with time or with work performed or with something else. I'm not actually sure because I don't know what, they were, what the system was really doing. Um, but it's these kind of things that are the important ones to characterize. They are the business affecting events. And I tend to call them hiccups. Uh, for lack of a better word. You could call them outliers or jitter. Jitter is not a really good word for this. Um, and, and those hiccups, or there's events where latency grows and then drops again, are usually, usually have nothing to do with load. They would happen at low load and they would happen at high load, and in fact they're of similar magnitude at high and low loads. They might happen more frequently at a high load, depending on what they're caused by. But as you can see, if you actually look at latency and you cared about something like the 99th percentile, in this case, by the way, it's the average latency over periods of time. So even during a period of time, there's an average here that's very high. Um, it's not a function of load that we're looking at. Yeah? Um, I'm not sure if there's a strong correlation there or not. You're right that visually there is some, when we have these jumps in the, in the users, they're like that. But I could show you 10 or 20 other ones where that's not the case. Um, it, the reality is we're looking at the variability of response time. Response time is not constant. It just isn't. And um, it, how many of you program in Java or C Sharp or some other managed runtime environment? Have you ever experienced garbage collection? Okay. So garbage collection is not a function of load. It happens as a result of you accumulating work. You work, you work, you work, and at some point you have to pay the piper. And you, depending on how you do it, you might stop the world, you might not, but you're going to garbage collect. And then you're fast again. And if you ran at double the load, all that'll happen is you'll generate more garbage, so you, it'll be more frequent that you get these spikes, but the size of the spikes won't necessarily move. 
It's a good example of that. If you want to look at other environments, databases that need to do re-indexing or some other journaling, shuffle, syncing work in the back, depending on how they're built, have another one of those, you know, accumulated work, periodically pay for it, then you go fast again. Those are very typical in response time affecting systems. So let's look at another chart. Um, this is a good example of another jittery hiccup, some with some correlation to an unknown thing. As you can see, the response time is typically almost perfect, but every once in a while it goes very high. And this is actually a controlled experiment. The way I achieved these hiccups is I went to the keyboard and I hit Control-Z and I counted to 10 and then I did foreground. Then I waited for a while and I did it again. I just stalled the computer. The important thing is you need to be able to measure, see when that happens to you and be able to describe it to you, to somebody else, rather than say, well, you know, the average was pretty good. You know, the fact that I stalled for 10 seconds at a time is different. Now, this is a picture from an actual low latency trading system measured over about 10 minutes. And I use this picture to depict why the word jitter is a terrible way to describe what happens to latency in software. Um, in this picture, and these scales are really good when you look at human response time applications. They're, you know, 20 milliseconds is right there. But in this uh, picture, the 99th percentile of all responses was 60 microseconds. Yeah, that's a pretty good number. Um, but these spikes are in the 10 to 20 millisecond range. They are 30,000 percent higher than the 99th percentile. Now, you could call that jitter. I mean, it does look noisy. But calling something that big as a signal jitter is like comparing skipping a heartbeat with cardiac arrest. That's roughly the same time scale, right? 10 minutes of no heart beating and your brain dead versus a skip and some pain. Um, so jitter is probably not the right way to look at it. These are periodic freezes um, and, and not a little bit of noise in the numbers. So um, when we look at these hiccups, and they happen in almost anything you actually measure if you actually look at the results, there's some very interesting behaviors you should find. They're typically strongly multimodal. They're not spread around. They're not sprayed around. There's a, multiple modes, and they don't look anything like a standard curve or a normal distribution. Um, you have these periodic freezes, and those freezes are a complete shift from one mode of operation to another mode of operation, and then back. And usually you have a good mode of operation. Your median, your 90th percentile, your 99th percentile might be in that mode. Then you have a somewhat bad mode, and then you have a terrible mode, and depending on how many modes you have, you can add to that list. But that's how typically latency seems to behave, especially in software systems. You know, if you're running on a computer that has more running threads than cores once in a while, you will see quantums of 10 milliseconds of scheduling context switches, where one guy gets the CPU, then another guy gets the CPU, because we have to share it and we have to slice it. Those quantums tend to be so much bigger than anything on the wire, from wire latency, that they tend to have those kind of hiccup behaviors as well. So what can we do to deal with these? How do people actually deal with standard, with, with the multimodal behavior, with the fact that latency is really all over the place and we need to try and characterize it? Well, the simplest way to deal with it is this. Um, it's a very common way, and I'll give you instructions on how to do this. <laughs> um, so beyond the part with the shovel and the sand, another way to achieve the same is to do this measurement. So you take your numbers, you add them all up, you, you collect them, and you run some stats on them. You derive your standard, your, your average, you derive your standard deviation. If you're really courageous, you get things like your kurtosis out of it, and, and you do other sanity checks. And, and at the end, you have a couple numbers that you report to people. You might even report the maximum if you, if you dare. Um, and that's a good summary, right? I ran this thing, I spent three days, I tuned it, I improved the number, here's the result. The average is this, the standard deviation is that, we're done, right? The problem with this is you're completely hiding any, all the actual behavior of the system. You don't actually know when you, when, when you finish with those numbers whether you have a normal distribution and a tight coupling or you have one of those 
30,000 percent outliers that happen 0.1 percent of the time and don't really affect these numbers. And when those effects are important, when they can break your business or break your systems, uh, covering over them like this is, is a good technique, um, especially if you don't want to report what's happening. Uh, but to give you an example, and this is from an actual conversation, um, when I talk to people and I and they describe some of the measurements they have, I often try and extract some information for them. Ask, see what they have that I can use, you know, if they have the mean, if they have the 90th percentile, if usually they'll have the maximum, that's an easy one to track. And then I try to see if they have more. Um, and a common way to ask to see what they have at their position is to see if they can answer a question about something like a percentile that they don't have or haven't reported. So they have their data, but I can ask, so you have your 90th percentile, could you, can you find the 99th percentile? Now, if they say, well, I have to rerun it in a different way, then I know measurement system is the way to get it. But sometimes they have a log of all the results, and all they have to do is go back, crunch the log, find the stuff. So it's, it's certainly possible when you have the data. I had a conversation um, a few, more than a year ago, with, with, a, with a customer or a prospect who had measurements and had a problem, and they described what the problem was. They gave me some numbers and they, you know, I, they had a 90th percentile and I asked for the 99th percentile and he said, yeah, I could get that for you. And, you know, went off for 20 seconds, came back with the number, gave me the 99th percentile. And I was happy because usually anybody who could do that, it means that they have all the data. I can then ask for the data set and I can crutch it myself and I can look for the other problems that I want to really look at without digging too hard. So I said, okay, that probably means you have the log. Could you give me the log? And the answer was, no, I don't have a log. I just computed this. I said, well, how did you derive the 99th percentile? So he said, well, I have the average. I have the standard deviation. I know that the 99.7 percentile is three standard deviations away from the mean. Now, this is a real story. And unfortunately, it's a very common one. If you actually backtrack to what happens here, we wish we we're looking at a normal distribution. We then take the data and we measure it and characterize it as if that wishful thinking is true. And then we extrapolate from that. And what we get is numbers that match what we wish and not numbers that describe reality. And in this specific case, we're talking about orders of magnitude off, like three orders of magnitude off. Okay, so this is always wrong. This is not sometimes wrong. This is not slightly dangerous. I've yet to meet a software system where the standard deviation had anything to do with the behavior of latency. And I challenge you guys to show me one. So I, I'm probably going to be wrong, and I'll be happy to look at logs for one. But if it's software, there's usually some glitch that's so big and so multimodal that standard deviation um, makes it impossible to have. If, if the result would have happened in normal distribution, it would have taken a billion years to achieve or something. So what can we do about this? Um, a better way to look at latency is to actually look at the whole distribution of latency. Measure it at different percentiles and as many percentiles as you can. This is a good example of a tool I use to describe or plot what response time looks like. For any percentile, there's a value here. And it shows you how response time behaves as a function of percent. This actually says that the 90th percentile is really good all the way to almost 99, probably about 98%. You have some really good behavior. Then it gets a little worse, but um, the nice thing in a plot like this is if this is the percentile curve, um, then these are your requirements. And you can plot them as a step function here and really easily tell whether or not you broke through them. So the requirements are, in this case, this is a telco application, I think. So they're required for 99.5% to be 30 milliseconds or better, and for everything to be 100 milliseconds or better. And the question is, does the system do this or not? No amount of average or standard deviation measurement will give you that answer. But you can measure, look at all the results, and count the percents, right? And it's a very typical business requirement, um, a way of stating one. So if we could measure it this way, we would have a feel for how things behave. And you can actually, if you stare at these plots enough, you start recognizing things in their shapes too. For example, this is a three-mode system. It has a very good mode, it has a somewhat worse mode, and it has a much worse mode. 
and, and it's a smooth system in that sense. It's got only those three modes and everything is concentrated around them. So let's look at requirements. Like if you want to express requirements, because at the end, the only reason to measure things is to actually compare them to either the requirements or to some other system to show that you're beating it. So we have a reason to measure latency, hopefully. And latency is really, you know, as a measurement, is the measurement of one event. It's how long one thing took. What we really want to know is how latency behaves, how the repeated measurement of latencies on many operations behaves over time. Um, and when we then collect that and find a way to describe it, we usually compare it to requirements as a pass-fail criteria. The requirement is to be this good. You measure it, if it is that good, you pass, and if it's not that good, you fail. It's pretty simple that way. Usually you want headroom, which means you want to be able to pass even at a higher load and a, and a bigger data set or whatever it is that you have. You want room around you, but you either pass or you fail requirements. You don't score 70% on them and go home. Um, so requirements need to be stated in a way that you can measure and you want to describe them in a way that matches the business or what the application needs. And those are very, very different things for different applications. And then they should reflect what you need and your measurements should be built to collect the information that is needed to answer whether or not you've met the requirements. So that's philosophy. Let's talk at examples of that philosophy in play. Let's look at applications and see what kind of requirements are natural to those applications. I classify them by, by example words like these, the Olympics, where this is, this is a classic uh, use case for really simple trading, for example. It's called ring the bell first. You know, there's, there's one opportunity, whoever gets there first will take it, no, but nothing else matters. Second place, third place, fifth place, don't matter. You either got it or you didn't. You have to be faster than everybody else and no faster than that, right? So how do we express you know, requirements for the Olympics? And let's talk in simple stuff. Um, our goal in the Olympics is to win gold medals. Let's assume it's gold. We're not there for silver or anything else. And to do that, we have to be faster than everybody else at some events, right? Um, it's okay to be slower in some events. As long as you're the fastest in at least one event, you have a gold medal, right? Um, it's okay to not even compete or not even finish in some events, right? That means that the worst case and the 90th percentile and the average don't matter at all. We're not winning gold medals by averages of races, right? Um, so the different strategies you can use in something like this could be, you know, I'm only going to focus on the ones I'm really good at. I'll wait for a race where I think my competitors are weak and tired. Maybe I'll, I've got really good stamina, so I'll compete in 17 races hoping to win one of them. Those are all different strategies. And, and trading in financial sector has similar games and strategies too. But this is a category. Ring the bell first. Another category of application is hard real time. Pacemaker is a really good example. Pacemaker has a really simple job to do. It needs to keep your heart beating. And it needs to never ever take longer than X to do that, right? Now telling somebody this will work 99.9% .9 of the time is not gonna make them feel good, okay? It's a good example where no, this application does not have a percentile requirement. Well, it, it does, but there need to be a lot of nines in there. Um, so it's, it's simply a hard, real-time, worst case is all that matters, and prove to me that it won't get worse than X, uh, at least within some reliability requirements. Um, so all these other metrics, averages, standard deviations, even if they meant something, are meaningless for this application, and that's all we care about. So let's get into a little more you know, places where we have a little we don't just care about ringing the bell, we, just don't, we don't just care about the worst case. One was what the best case was and we win, one was the worst case and we die if we don't get it. Um, soft real time, environments like uh, trading, telco, messaging are often like this. Um, we need to be fast enough to make some good plays. This is, I'm looking at trading specifically here. 
we, we want to win sometimes. We need to be fast enough to do that. Um, and we also need to contain the risk and exposure of bad plays. So we can win some, but the amount we lose and how we lose, we need to control that. So for example, most trading strategies today involve trading more than one instrument. You know, you're, you see an opportunity, you have some arbitrage to gain or a bet here, you buy this, you sell that and you close quickly. Um, and as long as you can get in and out of your, whatever it is you need to do, that works. But if you get caught in the middle with a shift of the market or a freeze of your system for 30 milliseconds and you're holding a few million dollars you don't want to be holding, that could cost a lot of money. So risk of exposure is just as important as, as uh, the percentage or the, the way you win some. But the way these systems typically work is you want to be typically fast. Usually in these systems today it's tens or hundreds of microseconds fast. In and out, quick, you're done. Um, but you can't afford to be caught, frozen, or holding something for tens of milliseconds in these systems. So you want a good typical, a good 50th percentile. Uh, I, I like medians much more than I like averages because medians at least mean something. You know, half my stuff is this or better. Um, and, and you also need a reasonable max and a reasonable high percentile number. So that's a very typical way to state requirements there. And I'm not using two specific ones here. But this is an application category with a motivation. Like I said, telco and messaging often look like this as well. Well, you have a, I want fast, and I need some percentiles, and I need a cap. Then we have interactive applications where humans are involved. I call that squishy real time. You know, it's kind of people are squishy. Um, the goal there is to keep customers or people happy enough that they won't complain or leave or buy somebody else's product instead of yours, depending on your business and how hard it is for them to switch. Your goals and pain thresholds might be different, but they need to be happy enough, right? Um, and that means usually when you write applications that they need to be typically snappy. You're not in the business of punishing your customers. And it's okay to have occasional bad long times. It is okay to do that. You're not expected to build a perfect system with a worst case of three milliseconds when humans are involved. There's no need to invest to that degree. Um, but it shouldn't be too often, right? Um, examples of how those tend to be described, you'll say 90th percentile would be in uh, hundreds of milliseconds because I want really snappy. 99th percentile will be below half a second. 99.9 percent, .9 one in a thousand, can be um, can be better. Can, could be as bad as two seconds, and I never want to see anything bigger than 10 seconds in the system. That's a common thing. This is actually a fairly lax requirement for an interactive AJAX portal these days. Um, note that it's it's okay to cross these lines. It's just uh, how often and when you describe these requirements, you have to remember we're talking about transactions or operations or requests, not about people. A person in one session might be doing 300 operations or more. So if you think 99.9 .9 percentile is a very thin kind of sieve and oh, one in a thousand will get through it, if I'm doing 300 operations per session, one in three people will experience your 99.9 .9 percentile. One in three sessions. Right? And if it's my wife and she's trying to buy a black shirt and there are plenty of places to shop for black shirts, she'll switch to some other place. Right? Um, hopefully my wife doesn't see this. Um, <laughs> I use that example a lot. A lot of our customers are uh, online clothing shopping sites for some reason. It uh, tends to be the most interactive uh, buying experience on the web. The number, the, how clicky everything needs to be, how much you browse, how, f how fast things are. So it tends to be a pretty demanding one from a response time perspective. And that will not be, will not pass as a requirement for those things on a Black Friday. Yeah. So I mean, don't necessarily have address it right now, but I'm sure you've come across clients or situations where certain response times or latencies are guaranteed as part of a contract with the customer. Yes. Do you think, does anything change when it comes to that or? So um, I see a lot of creative measurement when it comes to that. Um, so 
at the end, if we think about it from an engineering point of view, the system needs to have some requirements. We need to build to match them. Somebody told us those are the requirements, and that's usually a business thing. You know, yeah, we, we would really like to be able to build something that's so snappy fast that we'd be really proud of it, but if it's not needed, it's an expense we shouldn't bear. On the other end, we may think our code is really cool, but it's got this glitch in it that stops for 10 seconds once an hour, and the business might not be happy with that, right? Um, so it, an SLA is needed for you, for your business, for your boss, in any case, whether there's a contractual requirement and relationship that wrote it down somewhere, then people start measuring it, try to be accounting accountable for it, and how they measure it and whether or not they made a mistake while they measure it could carry a lot of money. Um, I do have a couple of examples where we've talked to people who found out that they measure wrong and that they've been reporting wrong. And then they face a problem because if they correct their measurements, their numbers will look worse than they were. Um, and, and they've been reporting like that. You know, that's embarrassing. So what do you do? And, and you know, the, these things happen. There's no, I mean, people make mistakes. But for example, my advice usually is if you do find a situation where you're, if you look through this and you recognize this in your business, and I mean, the best thing is go to your boss and say, hey, we've been measuring wrong. You're a hero now, go fix it. But if you actually had some contractual thing and you find out you're on the wrong side of it, then work to change how uh, reporting is done. You know, you're measuring the average and the 99th percentile start reporting the 95th percentile and the 99.9 .9 percentile. You get numbers that are not apples to apples and you can maybe get away with fixing it, being honest in the future and not being you know, necessarily blamed for what happened in the past. But uh, reality is, SLAs are there. Most actual contractual SLAs are very carefully written to allow a lot of leeway and a lot of headroom, um, including being fuzzy. Like it's very rare to get a worst case in a SLA. Um, anyway, um, if we look back to these, um, how do we establish these requirements? And I'm gonna go through an example of something. I, I actually go through this a lot um, because the situation for us is we have a, a JVM that improves latency behaviors, especially when they're outliers. So usually we talk to people who have a problem they want to fix. And we try to establish what winning means. Like, what do I need to do to say we're done? Not I want to improve and I want to improve and I want to improve. So I want to figure out what winning is. That means that I would like to have an SLA stated so we can test, show that we pass and that we could be done and ask for money. Um, Often people don't have a good SLA defined and extracting it from them is, is like pulling teeth. So we'll go through an example of that. You know, suppose you wanna know what you're supposed to build. How good is it supposed to be? And you're talking to a product manager or a product marketing person or some guy on the business side that the system is supposed to serve and you ask them what they need and they're kind of cagey about it and they're not sure because they really don't know. So you're supposed to actually interview them and extract this information. So let's go through an example. Now this is so small, I doubt you guys can read it. This will be online. Uh, but the first thing I say is, you know, what are your latency requirements? And usually they'll say, I want to be fast, right? Um, it fast might be, I want an average response time of 20 milliseconds. That's it. So I usually then say, okay, you want a typical response time of 20 milliseconds. I translate that later to a median. Um, but what's the worst case? And most often people say, we don't really wor have a worst case, you know, once in a while it'll be bad, I don't care. I mean, I don't have a worst case. I, I need that average to be good, right? Um, so how do I extract the worst case? I have a really simple technique for that. I say, so is it okay for the system to freeze for five hours? And they'll say no, hopefully they'll say no. If they don't, I'm done, right, in a batch system. I so, and if they say, no, it's not okay, I will start writing down, customer said, max allowable response time, five hours. And I'll say, no, 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 right? <laughs> so I'll say, what is it, right? And they'll say, write down, um, okay, I'll do the worst case, write down 100 millisecond. I never want to see bigger than 100 millisecond. This is an interesting point, by the way, because you're getting a negative reaction to something you did, and they don't really mean this. So you need to actually reverse and say, 
really? I mean, you really want a worst case of 100 milliseconds? This is a human response time application. Why do we need that? Are you willing to pay all the money that it'll take to do that and put up all the servers for the worst case? Come on, I mean, this will only happen once in a while. How bad, you know, you can't do five hours, but what can you do? And they'll think about it in this example, you know, you know, once a day, a few times a day, okay, make it two seconds, right? So now we've established a bar, no worse than two seconds, 10 seconds, five seconds, whatever it is. Now at this point, you know, you've, ex you've extracted a couple numbers, but this is not enough. All you have is a typical and a worst case, and you have no description of what should happen in the middle. Um, so the next step is to say, we have this, um, but you know, how often is it okay to be one second, right? We said never be more than two. I want you to typically be very short. Um, and, and at that point, they get a little annoyed and they say, well, didn't we just cover this? And they say, no, 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 we said that you'll never be more than two seconds, but I could be 1.9 seconds 5,000 times a day and I'm okay, right? So at this point, they usually get it. You know, they'll start thinking of, okay, so I need this bound and I need that bound. And what other bounds are interesting for my business? And they'll start giving you an SLA that kind of looks like this. That's kind of where you're going. You're looking usually for at least three, hopefully four points. You want a typical or median. Average is okay. They, when some people say average, they usually mean median. From a business perspective, I've... I've, like I said before, I've never met a business that could explain to me the reason for an average being needed except for a contractual requirement, which means the other guys didn't need it but required it. Um, so you need some sort of a typical. It could be the 25 percentile, it could be the 50th percentile. You need a max because you need to know what the actual bounds are. And then you need at least one point, hopefully two other points in the middle, and they should have a few nines in them. Okay. Um, so go through the mental exercise of what does it mean to us if we didn't have this and how bad would it be and then negotiate backwards. Okay, so we talked about different applications needing different things and you know how to try and define latency requirements and how to extract why we need them or what we need them for. And by the way, the spectrum is huge. It could be anything from human response time to we often deal with low latency ultra low latency, well, they weren't called ultra low latency, but very low latency trading, meaning in and out of a system in a handful of microseconds or maybe 20 microseconds. And that needs to be their three nines. And it's okay for them to have maybe a good fraction of a millisecond every once in a while, but these guys are never gonna see an old gen pause in the, during a trading day. And even small glitches like context switches are in their way. Um, so the spectrum is pretty wide and different businesses just have different needs. You shouldn't build the systems the same way for them and you shouldn't invest an effort into a very tight latency system where it's not needed. And the reverse is also true. If you build it and later try and deal with it, you're gonna pay dearly for it. So let's look at latency and how we should measure it or what's the context to measure it in. So remember this picture, this is the classic latency as a function of load to some degree, and it is to some degree a function of load. Um, so let's look at this a little and see how people, how, how people bound this. So response time in this graph is really not a number, it's, I call it the level of badness of the system. Because we have different requirements and depending on your requirement you may have multiple bars, but this is really how close or how bad are you. And what's acceptable and what's kind of, what's great what's good, what's not so good, but I'll still take it, and where do I scream? So marketing will always use that bar. That's how much the system can handle. It's a really fast system. It could do a lot of transactions per second, see? Right? It's never a practical way to use the system. Now, at this point, that's where the users complain, right? We drew the line where you have acceptable response time. When they're not acceptable, you're gonna hear about it. So that's when they scream. The sysadmin is going to want this much, or the, a good sysadmin would size their system to stay in the non-sensitive part of the curve, far away from the knee and with plenty of headroom. And that is roughly where sustainable throughput is. Sustainable throughput is a throughput at which everything still works. Right? So this is actually a definition I'd like you guys to keep in mind because I made it up, but you know, 
Um, the throughput at which you meet your SLA is sustainable throughput. That is often a much, much lower throughput than any marketing number or any benchmark that is pedaled to the metal in your system will do, right? This is not sustainable throughput. It's really cool and it's red, but it's not sustainable, right? Um, the question is how fast can I drive without hitting a pole? Not how fast can I drive between heating poles? That's not a very interesting measurement, right? It, it's, you know, unfortunately, most of testing that I see is how fast can I drive before between heating poles. The technique for doing that is really simple. Take a brand new cool system, put your software on it, drive the load as hard as you can, see how much you get. Now, if you actually measure the latency of that thing, you'll find that it's terrible because you've, by definition, saturated the system. You're well into queuing. Everything's unhappy. But look how fast I am. Right? Now, would you ever run that in production? Usually the answer is no, because no user will be happy with it. So the real question is, how fast can I go with happy users? So, you know, where are we supposed to measure latency? We're not supposed to measure it in the failure point or past the failure point. It's not wrong to measure it there. You're actually supposed to measure things to breaking points to find out when that is. But the interesting point there is not what was the latency, it's that it broke. Past the breaking point, I'm really not interested in what the average response time in a very deep queue is when I'm not going to have a queue in the real world. So the only use for this kind of measurement is to figure out where things break. It's not to figure out how much the system should be run at. Right? Um, latency is interesting in a very wide part of the spectrum, which is the good working part. Everything from idle until you break. and very importantly, where you think you're going to run in production. Um, and you should measure latencies at multiple different workloads, not one. There's no good way to characterize latency by measuring exactly one point because you don't know, don't know what it's actually sensitive to. So you want to measure at multiple points. This is an example graph of measuring multiple configurations and multiple points. So each line here would be a different run, maybe a different load, maybe a different setting, maybe a different tuning of the same overall software. And you want to see how it behaves at different levels. Okay? It's a good way of showing and comparing them to each other. And if you want, you can have a whole slew in spectrum for that. Now, to give you an example of this in play, in actual practice, this is, and again, they're very, very simple the, the text is so small there that you probably can't read it. This is an actual measurement for a mass messaging system, kind of a, a broadcasting system to lots and lots of client connections um, for something that is pretty latency sensitive. And it's comparing um, Oracle Hotspot at multiple different throughputs. This is 15K, this is 10K, this is 5K, this is 1K. Um, so you can see that you know, the behavior is pretty good up to the 90 plus percent, but then how, how it behaves and how bad it gets depends on load. So if this is the SLA, this red line here, which, you know, this is, I think, 90 percentile is 5 milliseconds, 99 point something is 10, and nothing should be worse than 20, then some loads pass it and some loads don't. The ones that don't, it doesn't really matter how much they missed by. Right? You don't get, you know, this 10K is not better than this 15K. Both of them fail in SLA, right? But there is a number here that passes. That's the 1K. It's just this is a system that can sustain 1K, cannot sustain higher, okay? Even though it can run 15K, it's a pretty large number, right? If you benchmark how many transactions per second, it handled 15K and even more. But it can't sustain it and keep SLAs going. So you need to know what load it'll be. And when you tell your sysadmin that you could do 1K, he's going to run it at 300. Because he wants 3X Hedra, right? Because as far as he knows, marketing is lying to him and three times so many people are going to come tomorrow. Um, by the way, on this graph, this blue line at the bottom is Zing. And the reason we spend a lot of time on how to show this is we try to figure out how to depict what we do and how good it is. And, when we're able to do 1K and 5K and 10K and 15K all down there, far, far away from the SLA, that explains to people what we're good for. If what we did is compare Zing at 15K to something else at 15K or Zig at 50K to something else at 50K, that's measuring two cars that have hit poles and we're trying to measuring 
I don't know what, their shape. But when we measure how fast can you go without crashing, that's where we get to show off. Okay, this is another example, a little more on the other end of the spectrum is the fat portal. Uh, this is actually Life Ray on JBoss done a couple of years ago. And you know, we took a JVM, drove it with a certain load, had an SLA that was pretty lax, half second at 90%, uh, five seconds, I think, at 99%, and nothing worse than 10 seconds. Remember, a fat portal, lots of state. Um, and we drove it pretty much, you know, tuned and drove it as, uh, see how many concurrent users we can handle at a certain load before this thing cracks. And what you're looking at there is kind of a regular hotspot JVM, almost cracking. Right? This passes. It almost cracks at this point. It almost passes the 99 percentile at five seconds. If we threw more users on it, it cracks. If we gave it more heap, it cracks. If we gave it less heap, it cracks. So we got it, you know, close. You know, it was probably if you could do a few more weeks of optimization, and get a few more percent maybe. Um, and then when we compare that to what we do with Zing, I usually, you know, I'll say, okay, there's a three gigabyte heap there and a 45 concurrent user load, and the exact same hardware system with our JVM was able to handle 800 users and look like that. And usually when people ask, so how do you do that? My answer is we cheat. Um, we use 50 gig heaps. And in a 50 gig heap, I've got room for a lot more users and I can use a 50 gig heap because I don't pause, so I don't break through the SLA, therefore I can handle more load. This is the same hardware and this, this hardware can handle 800 users with us and with other GVMs. Just we can handle it within the SLA. That's the difference. Okay, so those were examples of measuring latency, trying to compare latencies, trying to think of the motivations of latencies. Now let's talk about this coordinated emission problem because um, it's pretty bad. And like I said, I see it and the joke I, I usually have is that I see coordinated emission of in 99.9% .9 of cases. Okay? Uh, and I'm not sure how much emission there was in my measurement of that. Um, so a coordinate emission looks something like this. Um, you build a load tester. You buy a load tester. You, you create a test environment. And your test environment basically issues requests into a system, measures the response time, whether it's short, long, whether it's a complicated scenario or not, whatever it is. And it could be your own little tester. It could be JMeter or Grinder or HP Load Runner or one of those nice things you can buy. And every client thing in your tester is basically acting like an end user, sending in requests, getting responses, recording stuff, and doing statistics on that, right? And the statistics could be the entire percentile spectrum. It could be whatever else it is. Now, before we get into how to depict and how to report, like we showed before, what goes wrong here? Now, this kind of scenario works perfectly as long as there's never a single request that takes longer to respond to than the tester would have ish, uh, taken to issue another request. So, for example, if my test scenario says I need to issue a request every two seconds, then as long as no request responds in more than ten second, two seconds, I'm fine. I'll wait and I'll issue on time. As long as I execute it to plan, everything is fine. When you have a request that takes longer than the interval between requests would have been, and the client holds back, most of these clients do. They issue a request, they wait for the response, then they issue the next request, usually on a synchronous connection. Um, if the client holds back, you now have a coordination between the client and the system that affects measurement. It's lost a couple of opportunities to measure, right? Suppose it was supposed to issue something every second. Everything was perfect most of the time. There was this glitch of five seconds. It was supposed to issue five requests. It only issued one, right? Now, that won't happen that often, you'd say, and it shouldn't affect my numbers that badly, right? But it is a skew of the actual statistics. And when I call this coordinate emission, I mean, in your data, the set of data you were supposed to do any sort of summarization, statistics, percentile measurement on, it's as if somebody erased some data. Now, if you randomly choose data to erase, that's usually okay. But if you choose to erase data 
only at a point in time where long response times happen, you're skewing the actual data. You're literally erasing data that, and then describing only the good parts. So let's go through an exercise of how this could work in practice and how bad it could get. And remember, this is hypothetical, but then we'll get into practical. So, yeah. So hopefully, in what I talked about before, the only interesting throughput for something where you're measuring stuff like that is sustainable throughput. So you're measuring throughput, and you say what the response time was while you were doing the throughput. And you're going to lie badly on the response time, so you'll think that you passed. And we'll go through the exercise exactly that, and I have a J-meter picture for you for it. Um, yeah. So that's a fair answer. So um, people respond to back pressure. But when your business told you that you're supposed to give a good response time 99.9% .9 of the time, they didn't mean only when people are asking the next question. They mean if somebody randomly came in here and rang the bell, you should answer within this amount of time. And it's OK for you not to do that one in a thousand. Not one in five, one in a thousand, right? Um, let, let's go through the example and hopefully it'll make, you, make, it, make it clear how bad it is to assume that you know, coordination in the real world happens. Um, so let's take a, a very hypothetical system, easy to model. It handles 100 requests per second perfectly. Every single request comes back in exactly one millisecond. Now I'll take that system and I'll freeze it for 100 seconds, 100 seconds into the run. So half the time it's running perfectly, and half the time it is completely frozen, right? Now this is a simple system, and if your boss asked you how this system behaved, you would probably be able to describe it pretty well. Let's go through, go through the mental exercises of doing that. On the left-hand side, we have 100 seconds that average one millisecond. Perfect, right? On the right-hand side, we have 100 seconds during which nothing happened. That means that the average during that 100 seconds was 50 seconds. If I came up uncoordinated at some point in there, a user knocked on the door, get into the thing, on the average, a user would get a 50 second response time if they tried anywhere in that window. At the beginning, it'll be 100. Towards the end, it's closer to zero. It averages 50. The overall average for this 200 second period is roughly 25 seconds. This is us describing what the system actually does, not measuring it, okay? Now these are other stats that you would probably agree are intuitive. Roughly the 50th percentile is still really, really good here, one millisecond. The 75th percentile is about halfway up into the bad stuff, that's 50 seconds. And the 99.99 .99 percentile is pretty close to 100 seconds. All these are pretty intuitive, right? Any questions so far about this? This would be a good way to describe the behavior of the system if we're asked questions about these numbers. Now let's measure this with JMeter, with LoadRunner, with something else. And we'll do it with one client. By the way, this problem appears per client. So you could do it with 100 clients, you'll get the same stats. Each client has this problem. But we do it with one client thread. So we measure on the left, we get 10,000 responses during a 100 second period. Each one was a perfect one millisecond. We measure on the right, we got one response. It took 100 seconds. Then we're back to normal. Let's do the math, right? The 99.9% .9 .9 of this sample was one millisecond. That's the same system, right? The average is 10.9 milliseconds, not 25 seconds. The standard deviation is 0.99 seconds in this case. And the other one I showed what it is. Um, as you can see, this is a badly mistaken characterization of this hypothetical system. But if you have a measurement system that when presented with this system gives you these results, you shouldn't believe anything else it tells you. Because none of its measurements are reflecting any kind of stall. This is a measurement system that measures the good stuff and a tiny bit of the bad 
even when the bad stuff dominates or is a big half. Okay, and this is a good example of the, you know, if I had a user here and they said, well, you know, when I don't give them an answer, they wait for 100 seconds. Well, they don't wait for 100 seconds. They're on to the next business at that point. But if you were in the business of serving the web and half the time you're off, you're going to feel that as a business. Uh, you know, the fact that people ease off doesn't help there. So what's going on here? What are we missing? Hopefully it's somewhat obvious, but what's really going on is when we measure percentiles and when people specify percentiles, they don't mean when you go over there and you ask them if they're ready and if they're ready, then say, I'm going to send your request in a couple minutes, please be ready. And then when they send it, they give you a good result and then you measure the good results. It's let's do surprise inspections and what percentage of the surprise inspection give you what result? That's what the expectation of the actual description usually is. That means that there should be as many measurement opportunities on the left as there are on the right. And there are 10,000 missing measurement opportunities on the right that this load generator just didn't measure because it was busy waiting for one. And by missing that, we skewed all the results. Now, if we added all those back in, this would be a correction to coordinated emission you would get exactly the stats that you'd have there. It's not 10,000 results, each of which is 100 seconds. It's one result of 100 seconds, and then 99.99 seconds, 99.9, .9, and all the way down, right? Because there, it's, it's linear. Almost to the end, it's very close to really good. That's what's missing. That's what we didn't measure. Now, unfortunately, we didn't measure it. We don't really know what happened there. It's blank. And... The question you're faced with when this happens is, what should I report when I don't know what happened? And you can take two approaches. One is to be ultra-optimistic, which is what all the current load generators do, which is, I don't know, so I didn't measure. I only measured when I could. Um, you could take the conservative approach, which is to say, I should assume during that time that whatever happened there was at least as frequent as what happened outside of it, because I don't know any better. And you could do something in the middle. Usually when I correct results, I try to do careful undercorrection, correction um, meaning I don't want to go overboard and correct too much. But what I recommend to people when they report for their own sake is you should overcorrect, Because when somebody tells you 99% of the time it'll be X, you will take that to mean at least 99.9% .9 of the time it'll be X. Or it's going to be better. You don't expect it to mean, well, 99% or less, you know, maybe 50, right? If it was 99.9% .9 and it was too conservative, you'd still, you know, you'll have your requirements right. So overcorrection is actually the right thing to do if you're doing this for internal reporting. My correction techniques are usually under correction because I'm explaining, I'm, I'm trying to explain that the correction is needed, so I'm trying to be conservative on the other side. Um, but you could go either way. So let's, let's use some, some actual examples. Um, this is JMeter measuring a scenario much like the one I just described. It's a simple web server that is frozen for half the time. At the top, you have what JMeter reports when it sees that. That's the percentile graph for JMeter going from 0 to 99%. And you can see that at the very top, it saw something. That same thing corrected. And um, at Azul, we actually... Um, I hired an intern for the summer that spent the entire summer working on JMeter, building a corrector for it, an estimator for it, a pattern detector, so it can actually look in complex scenarios as long as they're not random timing and find the patterns and do the right corrections, and the corrector does that. Basically recreates the missing things based on interpolation from the previous results during, during missing time. And that's a correct depiction of what the system was doing. The system was doing exactly that. It was running perfectly half the time and it was frozen half the time in a duty cycle. Another example, this is from the real world, um, the YCSB benchmark. Uh, how many of you know what YCSB is? It's the Yahoo Cloud something benchmark. It's the benchmark people use to measure uh, key value pair systems. Memcached, Cassandra, lots of other things. It's a common measurement technique. And sometimes you stare at results and the fact that there's coordinated emission just jumps straight at you. So let's look at some of the numbers here. Um, over here we have 
this, by the way, is a single client tester. That's how the tester is built. And it ran for some amount of time here, a uh, total time of, um, I don't know, 200 and about 2,000 seconds or so. During that time, it experienced a max latency of 26 seconds, 26.182 seconds. There was an event, and we know it's a single client, and we know that the client froze for that amount of time. Okay? We also happen to know there was a GC pause that long. This was Cassandra. Um, then the 99th percentile, if you look at it and you compute just based on the two numbers I said so far, since 26 seconds represents 1.29% of the overall runtime of this benchmark, you can know that the 99th percentile has to be at least 5.9 seconds. And this lists out the math for that. Basically, 99th percentile leaves 1%. This is 1.29%, so the 99th percentile is, least, is at least 0.29% of the overall runtime. I can deduce that just from those two numbers. By the way, it's pretty lucky when I can, because often the coordinate emission is there, but it doesn't stare at you that badly. Um, the reported 99th percentile for the benchmark is 5 milliseconds. That's 1,000x off on an actual benchmark. It's a benchmark that Memcached is, used, is sized with today. It's a benchmark people use to size Cassandra systems. So here's what not to do, okay? Believe this benchmark. By the way, the technique that they use is very interesting and the correction for it, I'm, I'm hoping to upstream a fix for it because it's pretty easy to fix. Um, they realize that they miss opportunities to measure. So instead of having a client that just sits there and sends something and when it gets one, sends another one, they have a given throughput they're trying to achieve. They're trying to drive at a certain rate. And the way they drive at a certain rate is they issue enough requests so that the number of requests matches the time that they're at. So if they fall back and they freeze, then they catch up and they send a bunch of requests. And you'd think that would be a good thing because it keeps the throughput right. The problem it does is that it doubles the error. Not only do they not measure during the bad time, but then they measure extra during the good time. So they replace bad results with good results. They don't just erase them. So the error is skewed double in that case. The correction here would be to say every time you do one of those catch up things, don't report the response time as the time it took from when you issued the request until it came back. Report it as the time from when you should have issued it until it came back. And that would have corrected it. I actually have that piece of code in, on my laptop, but haven't really cleaned it up or tested it yet. So it's an easy thing to fix in a benchmark. It's just the awareness for it needs to be there. And, and the same goes for other things. Uh, asynchronous testers running with very large think times. These are all good ways to get around this if you can. Unfortunately, in messaging and low latency and trading systems, all those things are really hard to do. You are faced with a high throughput single client stream and there's not a lot of things that you could do to emulate for it, so you need to model what happens during freezes. So let's look at other real world examples and hopefully you're getting the picture. This is all around you. Um, how many of you think that you're actually doing this today? Be honest. Okay. <laughs> so some, let's say 10% right now. I, I, I encourage you to go look at your, at your stuff afterwards. So this is a good, interesting observation from a SpecJ Enterprise 2010. This is a benchmark with an SLA. It's got a requirement that the 90th percentile be a certain number um, at a certain load. And if you pass that number, you're golden and you can publish your result. This is output from a world record result from a few years ago. And this is the actual stuff from the web page. You can see the averages there. You can see the standard deviations. You have the 90th. The only actual requirement here is the 90th percentile. And you can see the requirements next to it. So at this very high 10,000 transactions a second kind of thing, this benchmark is beating the 90th percentile requirement almost by an order of magnitude. It's very interesting. Very, very you know, impressive. Now, this benchmark also reports one additional number that's not required, and that's the maximum time experience. Mind you, this is a one-hour timing run. During that one-hour timing run, almost all the transactions experienced a five-minute pause. Systemically, across all of them. 
this is actually multi-client. And this is, uh, there's a database system, there's a clustering of lots of instances, there's, well actually this is a single instance, but, but a fat one, and then there's lots of clients hitting it. Spectre Enterprise is a fairly complicated thing. It takes a couple weeks just to get it off the ground. Um, but the key thing there is, you know, there's a 90th percentile requirement, no max requirement, um, and if you pass the 90th percentile, you're good. Usually I turn around and ask people, how many are you okay with 10% of your transactions failing? Because it's allowed, right? And in case you're doubting whether or not that happens, during a one hour run, this server froze for five minutes and it scrolled a world record doing it, and that's allowed. So that's, you know, if you're running that fast. So the other interesting thing is that max is so big, it's 762 standard deviations away from the mean. It's a great example of how meaningful standard deviation is. Now, I actually don't know how many nines are in 762 standard deviations. There's so many we probably can't film in the room. Um, I think that's, that seven standard deviation is 10 nines or something around that. So you, you, can, you can figure how many nines there are. There would have been several thousand or million Big Bang events before this would be possible if this was a normal distribution. It's just a great example of why standard deviation means absolutely nothing in these tests, right? It's, I, I highly recommend you don't even show it. If you do show it, just be, remember to ignore it. And the only reason I report it is to show how silly it is, okay? So you'll see the tools I talk about later. Every one of them tends to report standard deviation at the bottom of a histogram just because it's always so glaring how far that away is away from predicting anything. Okay, so some more real world stuff. This is from an actual customer. Um, and this is a measurement of their, their log file, basically plotted in response time terms. Now here, you can see some very interesting thing on the shape of the graph. Remember I told you if you stare at these, you start learning to see things in them. This top graph is an uncor uncorrected uh, look at a log. And just by plotting it, I could tell you there's coordinate emission in the results. The way I can tell is there's these sharp breaks in the line. It's not smooth at, at high latencies. And from experience, that happens when somebody erases 100 milliseconds of your file. It looks like that. It may not always happen that way, and there might be systems where it looks like that and it's not coordinate emission, but usually you don't meet those. Um, when we looked at the file, by the way, we saw that every time there was something in the, what is this, you know, a few hundreds of milliseconds or thousands of milliseconds, immediately after it, there was a gap of that long in the log file. No responses logged, right? So clear coordinated emission there. The fixes and the shifts were not that frequent. They were at very, very low frequency that the bad things happened. But the bottom line here is a coordinate, it's a corrected one. So the exact same log file with the gaps filled. Uh, I have a tool that does that to log files. You tell it what the expected interval is, and it'll basically recreate any, gap, any responses linearly between the gaps. Um, and if you actually compare down at the requirement point, the business requirement here was for the 99.9 .9 percentile to be better than one second. That was the business requirement. The, uncord, the uncorrected set showed them passing by a pretty nice margin the corrected results showed that they were failing by about 5x or 4x. And this is, again, what do you report to the business? There's a requirement, you know, reality is down there, that's what ends up being reported. Um, so wrong by 7x unreported. This is a fresh one from just last week. This is a low latency trading environment. What I like about these places is the people tend to be really smart and they're aware of problems and they look for how to fix them. So we came in there to figure out how to measure stuff and we looked at the raw data. And remember, just from the shape, I can tell there's coordinate and emission in this thing. It's jagged and it's sharp. Uh, so this is the, uncoordinated, the uncorrected data. Um, it does show that there are some interesting maxes into the hundreds of milliseconds and something that's typically in the tens of microseconds. But that happens so rarely, it's like in the seven nines. So yeah, max is there, but how bad is it, right? Business requirements are for some number of nines. When we correct the data, it looked like that. 
These are two different correction levels. One of them is a under correction, one of them is a slight over correction. You choose which one you want for reporting. As I said before, I, I, I usually recommend if you're reporting internally, you want a more conservative case. Um, so the corrected result looks like this, and that moved the number of nines at which the bad things happened by three and a half orders of magnitude. Um, now, why do I care about this? So this is a customer. Um, yeah. So in this specific case, this is not a load generator. This is actual market data coming in at 100,000 things a second. And the problem you have is all we know is we froze for 400 milliseconds. So how many data points am I supposed to put in there? The conservative one said, yeah, I'll correct stuff with a moving average of the last one second of things that I've seen, how fast it is, but I will not introduce more than 10,000 new results into the log file no matter what I see. So it's conservative, it's uh, under correcting, right? The other one was correcting with the moving average. And, and you can see that, I mean, they're very similar in the effect, just you know how much they pull it in, right? Um, and I usually do these kind of things because it is a correction and we're making up data that is missing. So rather than say this is the true data, I like to bound it. This is what it is if you want to be conservative about the correction. This is what it is if you want to be conservative about reporting. So you choose which one you want to use. But it's clear that the reality is somewhere between those two, not where the blue line is. Right? And you can see that they're fairly consistent with each other, just in shape. Now, this, the reason we've built a lot of experience in this is, to me, this is in my way. I make a system that eliminates big bad pauses. When the big bad pause only happens at the 7-9 level, the value of what I do is not that high. When it happens at the 2.5-9 level, on something that happens 100,000 times a second in its actual market data for trading, my value is very high. So this, at the bottom there, is zinc. With all the corrections in both ways. And yeah, we also are affected by this. And uh, the correction does pull the zinc numbers over. If you zoom down here, you'd see a little bit of skew. But clearly, you know, the other JVM is affected a lot more, or gets a lot more credit for not measuring the bad times because we don't have bad times to not measure. Um, and if we're comparing with something that ignores the bad times, we end up looking bad. This was a 2,500x difference in where the bad things happen. And this is a real system from a week and some ago. OK, so suggestions about this. And we have a little bit of time left here to talk about tools, and I'll get to those. Um, Whatever your measurement technique is, test it and measure it, calibrate it. And the best way to do that is to create a hypothetical system that you know the behavior of, like I showed you with that duty cycle system, and ask your system to measure it and report on it. And until that report describes what you believe is happening, nothing else that that thing reports should be trusted. And unfortunately, this happens with most testers that I find. So you're going to find work to do when you do this. I'm sorry about that. Um, so don't waste your time analyzing things until you've verified that. And you know, this goes like to basic physics experiment. You've got to calibrate your workbench before you start you know, doing anything with the data. Um, don't ever, ever derive anything from standard deviation. Um, and always measure the max times. Take it, consider what it's telling you. It's the one number that is impossible, well, almost impossible to cheat on. Uh, if you're measuring it from outside the system, it's usually truly impossible to cheat on. If you're measuring inside the system, sometimes the garbage collection pause happens outside of your measurement window, so you can cheat. But if you're measuring from outside the system, it's really hard to hide a max time. It's easy to hide percentiles, but usually the max will show up and then you have missing stuff. So be very suspicious and sanity check the max versus the other results. You saw how I did the math for the YCSB case, for the SPECJ Enterprise case. They're, they're suspicious. So when you see big maxes that are far away from your results, consider whether or not you have stuff like that. And then you can use some of these graphic tools, graphing tools to see if you have suspicious shapes in your percentile graph. 
Um, measure percentiles, measure lots of percentiles, and we'll talk now about ways to do that. Any questions so far? A good pause point. Okay. Yeah? When you said uh, you corrected the J meter results, was that a, uh, a mathematical correction or was it was a reintroduction of results that didn't actually occur. So what we did is we, we got in between the uh, actual measurement threads and, uh, and uh, things they log into, and we, we sat on that stream and we created me results that look like the exact same pattern, repeating the same pattern, the same data, but at diff a different response time. So measurements that didn't really occur were inserted in there to basically interpolate according to that. And it's done with a, there's a pattern recognizer and there's an estimator of what the actual interval is because, um, you know, it, it, this is easy if you have a fixed interval, but often, like, J-meter doesn't have an interval, it has a think time, usually. So there's variance in this and you have to somehow smooth it out. Yeah? Um, the problem is a per thread problem. You can achieve the right results by having enough threads on JMeter so that no thread would ever need to issue a result or request more than once an hour. And then as long as the system doesn't pause for an hour, you're good, right? Or once a minute and do those. Remember, pauses of tens of seconds occur in the real world, so, you know. Hmm? Yeah, exactly. That works for JMeter, it works for web workloads. The areas it doesn't work for are where the real system you're testing has 10 streams and that's it. It, it doesn't have 20,000 things, it only has 10 or one. And then it's, you know, it's really hard to, to create an asynchronous thing for that if it's talking through a synchronous system. So for example, if it's UDP, you can actually write an asynchronous tester. Twitter has a really interesting one, by the way. Up. It's open source. Um, but if it's a synchronous connection down TCP and you're doing 10,000 things a second down there, if the thing freezes, there's nothing you can do to, to get around it. There's just missing time. And usually that missing time correlates with the worst behavior of your system. So. Okay, I'll go into some tools that I've built. Um, there's something I call HDR histogram that I built. It's open source. It's actually public domain code up on GitHub. And it's now pretty mature. A lot of people have started using it and integrating it into software. It's Java. Um, a couple of people are working on Python and on C ports of it as well. But HDR histogram is what lets you graph things like these at this kind of fidelity or this kind of resolution. The HDR part stands for high dynamic range. And when you want to plot 99 and 99.9 .9 and 99.99, etc you're starting to, you need high dynamic range with fairly good accuracy in order to do that without having weird jagged things. So a little bit of background on what this is about. The goal here is to collect, specifically for me it was latency characterization, but it's good for any value, counts of values histogram. Histograms are useful for all kinds of things. Um, and we want to keep acceptable precision across a fairly wide range so that we can plot percentiles into the deep percentile counts. Um, the existing alternatives to doing this are usually either recording all the data and later analyzing it, and that works. So, you know, if you have a record of every single thing, you can always do statistics on it later. The problem with that one is it explodes, right? If you have a trillion things, where are you going to put them? Or your logs get really big. And remember, Logging 100,000 things a second for market data is, you know, that act alone could ruin your system if you actually try and record it on the side. The other one is to record in traditional histograms. And traditional histograms usually have one of three forms. They're either linear buckets or bins, they're logarithmic bins, and they're arbitrary bins where linear and logarithmic don't give you what you want, so you create your own ranges. Each of these has problems. Linear is accurate. You can actually decide exactly what the accuracy is you want, resolution. The problem is it's linear. So if you're covering any kind of significant range, you need a lot of space, too much space for some things. Um, logarithmic is nice on space and speed. 
Um, but it's got terrible precision because it's usually log logarithmic in buckets of powers of two and basically you're 50% off on anything. If you tried to plot the percentiles of that, you would not be able to tell coordinate emission from smooth things because the jaggeds will be there in the values. Um, so you have dynamic range, you just don't have accuracy within it. And then arbitrary is just, it's the worst of all things because it's arbitrary and it usually depends on you knowing what the value range would be because you have to guess at what the buckets would be if you're building a system and you don't know whether you're going to look at milliseconds or seconds or tens of seconds. You don't know where to put the arbitrary buckets. So HDR histogram was, I'm not sure why other people haven't built this before. Honestly, I'm kind of surprised. I didn't think I was building something new. Um, but it seems like other people haven't done histograms this way. The, the histogram is built to cover a wide configurable dynamic range with configurable accuracy. For example, you could tell it I want to track from a microsecond to an hour, and I want to keep three decimal points of accuracy across that range. Which means at microseconds, I want microsecond resolution, and at thousand seconds, I want one second resolution, and everything in between. Um, internally, uh, by the way, it comes with an optional coordinate emission corrector. So you could just tell it what the expected interval is as you record, and if you tell it what the expected interval is, it'll create that linear interpolation for you. That's how I do these corrections. Um, it's open source, as I said before, it's actually public domain. And, and internally, the way it works is very interesting, or at least to me, it's a fixed voice, it's a fixed close, both in space and time. So it's a fixed data structure. It does not grow with more recordings. And it has a constant access time into it, uh, regardless of what it is you're recording. There's no searches, there are no iterations through it to record. Uh, it's really built for very low latency systems to be able to use it. So there's zero allocation during any of the operations on it. So it's kind of fast. And on my laptop, on this laptop, it can record 300 million things a second. It's about three nanoseconds per recording when it's hot. So it's pretty damn cheap. Um, mostly, if it's cold, you're going to have some cache misses, so it's going to be more than three nanoseconds, but it's pretty damn cheap. Um, the internals of it really build something that looks a lot like a big floating point data structure. It's not linear and it's not logarithmic, it's a hybrid of both. You can think of it as having an exponent part and a mantissa part. The exponent part gives me the dynamic range. The mantissa part gives me the resolution you asked for. You wanted three decimal points, they're going to be, there's going to be a big enough mantissa for that. And you can look at it graphically kind of like this. If you ask for two decimal point resolutions, there'll be logarithmic buckets like these, and each logarithmic bucket will have linear sub-buckets. That's your exponent, that's the mantissa. It's hard to draw this because the powers of two grow really fast, and most of these have 20 or 30 buckets. Um, but it translates into one flat array of longs in memory. So it's really fast. You take in a number, it does some bit manipulations and shifts, figure out as an index, increments a number, and it's out of there. That's how fast it is. Um, it's actually not, it doesn't use uh, decimal, it actually uses powers of two because the operations are more convenient when you do that. So whenever you give it number of decimal points, I round up and get a power of two that includes that. So that's the actual bucketizing that'll happen for two decimal points. For three, it'll be 1024 in the first bucket. Um, it has all kinds of nice iteration tools. You can take a histogram you've recorded all kinds of results into and then iterate through it linearly, logarithmically, or by percentiles. And there are Java iterators to walk through all those. So you can choose how you want to walk through it. You want a linear histogram, it is a linear histogram. You want a logarithmic histogram, it's that too. And it has the fidelity to do percentiles well. Um, and percentile iterators are interesting because it lets us output that. Now, don't expect you to read that from there, but that goes straight into the spreadsheet that plots the numbers. So that many dots are good enough to plot something that smooth. And what's actually in there when you look at the dots, it's kind of like a, a, the turtle game, right? Uh, you tell it how many ticks per half it should have. So, I usually use five ticks per half, which means 10 percentile, 20, 30, 40, 50. That's half, half to one. And then it goes to half that. So uh, the next half to 75% will also have five ticks. So it'll go down to 5% steps, then two and a half percent steps. 
goes shorter and shorter and shorter the closer it gets to one until it exhausts all data. So it's going to keep going until it, it's got the number of nines that are in the data. It just it stops at 100%. Um, and the log file tends to be fairly short because, you know, 100 lines will cover billions of results with good percentile accuracy. Okay, so that's HDR histogram. Now, there's another tool that I've built called jhiccup. How many of you have seen this tool before or have used it? Oh, good. So maybe you'll use it after this. Um, so jhiccup actually has HDR histogram in it, and it measures a really simple thing. We find that uh, the problem I was trying to solve is how do I characterize how a system is behaving without knowing what the system does, what the right way to measure it is. And since we're specifically in the business of fixing pauses in systems, I wanted to figure out a way to measure the fact that a system is pausing rather than believe logs or believe coordinate emission log file stuff like that. So I built jhiccup to basically document discontinuities of execution of a JVM. And it's a very simple thing that basically plots, it's always this format. Over time, you have kind of these max times per interval, and you've already seen this graph in the previous things I've seen, I've shown. And at the bottom, you have your percentile histogram for that. But what I'm plotting here are hiccups. Hiccups are, the system had a hiccup. It wasn't running anything for that amount of time. And the way I detect that is pretty simple. Um, well, this is how to run it, and it is open source. But the way you detect it is really simple. Um, puts a thread to sleep for a millisecond. When a thread wakes up, it says, how long has it been? If it's more than a millisecond, it says, that was a hiccup. Now, if you have a hiccup of tens of microseconds, that's usually noise, and it naturally has a noise of 50 or 60 microseconds. But if a thread that went to sleep for one millisecond took 500 milliseconds to sleep, you could pretty much bet every thread in your JVM experienced the same thing. It basically documents that a thread that had nothing to do but was supposed to run and was immediately going to go to sleep so it's not using any real CPU didn't get to run for whatever reason that is. It doesn't say why, and the why is very why. This could be because the JVM stalled it. It could be because power management decided to put that CPU to sleep, and we've seen bugs where that takes two seconds to wake up sometimes. It could be context switching. It could be the file cache in Linux deciding to put your code on disk, and you're paging it back. It could be any of those. The only thing it knows is there was a hiccup. And then you go and try and figure out how your system behaves. The reason this tool is very useful is that it provides a best case description of what your latency is in your system. If this is honest, then no response time you are measuring on your system can behave better than this tool. It's measuring what it takes to do nothing. So jhiccup is a good sanity tester. It's a good way to check your results versus something else. And often it's a good way to just depict what your system behavior is from a system noise perspective, not from a work and queuing perspective, so that you can clean up the system itself. And I've had a lot of people use it for all these purposes, especially to figure out what idle noise look like. You know, you run it on an idle system and you see 20 millisecond hiccups, you're not going to do any better than 20 millisecond noise on that unless you clean the system up. And with this, we've had people clean the system out to, say, on Linux, worst case of half a millisecond kind of natural noise uh, before they go on. So uh, these are just some depictions within it. But if you're wondering why I really built it, this is a great way to document that. This is Charles Nutter, the JRuby guys, tweeted that when he saw it. And it's, it's an honest description of why I built it. So let's show you how that works. Um, on the left, we have Hotspot. On the right, we have Zing. This is, a, this is an application with, I think, a, it's a one gigabyte cache and a an gigabyte heap running some load. And can you see how much more beautiful Zing is on the right? Well, you probably can't see it because they both have spikes, but let me highlight the scales. Let me now normalize the scales. And, and that's a good way to show you know, why you want to use Zing when you have that. I often say it's really hard to show how you're a thousand times better when you only have 500 pixels. Um, this doesn't just work in squishy real-time for humans. It also works in uh, 
soft real time for low latency. And this is the same trick done on a low latency system. This is the system I showed you before with that jitter. And again, normalized, it looks like this. Okay. So um, I use this tool a lot. It's a great way for us to figure out whether there's a problem we can solve and then to show whether or not we solve the problem, even when I don't know how you measure. So that's why I built it. But I find that it's very useful for people to measure against their own measurement systems just for sanity checking. You don't have to tell us anything about it. Uh, it's a good observer as opposed to a log parser. It actually measures what it experiences. And if it disagrees with your system, one of them has a bug. The good news is there's about 600 lines of code in this one. So it's easier to find the bug. Um, so I'm going to do a tiny bit of shameless bragging at this point and over time. Um, yes. So HDR histogram is simply a tool for recording latency data or any count data. Every time you have a latency, you dump it in there, and later you can run stats on it. It will actually report standard deviation if you want to. It'll do averages. It'll give you percentiles. You do whatever you want with that. Um, you can use it for that purpose. You can use it for other purposes. It's just a class for a histogram. Uh, JHiccup uses it to, that's where it records all those one millisecond wake-up times. Um, and then it, it reports with that. JHiccup is a tool for figuring out whether your system is continuously running, whether your JVM is continuously running. And if it's not, what is the percentile graph for that not being continuously running? It's, gonna, no, it's not going to show your processing time in your application. It's going to show the zero time. Often, for example, when you have garbage collection, the dominant thing in your response time is the garbage collection pause. And it will see that. Right? If you have a perfect system and your code is taking 300 milliseconds to process before it answers, it's, a, it's not going to see any of that. And if you have internal queuing, it's not going to see that either. It's just saying whether the computer is smooth and running. Right? And, and no computer is smooth and, and continuously running, so it just documents how much. Right? So a little bit about Zing. This is a new logo they made for Java one, so I'm putting it out now. Um, Zing is our product. It's a JVM for Linux x86 systems. Basically, completely eliminates garbage collection as an issue for enterprise applications, and it does that across a very, very wide spectrum. All the way from those annoying multi-second pauses that you might have on a few gigabytes of heap, all the way to you can run three, 400 gig of data if you want to, and it won't pause any worse than if it doesn't, which is very small and all the way down to you're a low latency guy that runs tens of microseconds of operations and a 20 millisecond blips is gonna kill you. And we eliminate those two. Uh, so basically think of it as garbage collection gone, not as a process, but as an issue. It runs, it does its job, but it does it without stalling or pausing the system. There are technically little glitches and pauses, but they are smaller than other things in the system. They're smaller than Linux's context switches. And smaller than, basically when you look at jhiccup, GC is no longer the major contributor to any of those with Zing. And since it's usually the dominant contributor without Zing, it's easy to draw the difference. Um, it decouples metrics like scale metrics from response time. So how big you are, how many things per second you do, doesn't have a link to whether or not your JVM is going to freeze for X amount of time. The notion that a computer should be okay to freeze for X amount of time is is kind of a, a weird one that was introduced with garbage collection. Um, and we have some cool stuff like elastic memory. What is it good for? If you've got a Java server-based application running on Linux and use more than about 300 meg of memory, you're probably going to benefit from Zing in the sense that it'll show better metrics. Now, whether, you need, whether or not you need those better metrics, that depends on your requirements. And we talked about what that means, right? So not everybody needs Zing. But at this level, you can see a difference. Um, where it really shines is low latency, machine-to-machine uh, -machine communications, uh, human response time things when you have a lot of state in memory, whether it's caches or in-memory stuff or, or just big fat sessions. 
um, and large data analytics, a lot of interactive data analytics for risk, for ad placement, where you're crunching data cubes of tens of gigabytes and a human is involved, and a human doesn't really like it when the system freezes for 30 seconds every once in a while. Um, I, one of our customers, when I asked them to tell me what they think we do for them when we, they deployed us for a real-time risk system, a trade authorization risk system crunches tens of gigabytes and gives authorization to trade. He thought for a little while and said, um, you save us a lot of keyboards. And it took me a while to figure out what that means. And he said, have you ever seen a trader waiting for a pause on a trade authorization? You know, we're lucky if it's keyboards. Um, so you know, it's, it's just a quality of service kind of thing. Um, so that's it for the bragging. Uh, on the takeaways, standard deviation is never, never to be done. Hopefully it's not even on the same page as your results. Uh, if you haven't started, you know, if you haven't measured percentiles and max, you haven't really characterized your system. Um, you wanna measure latency with throughput. One without the other doesn't actually have a meaning. If you want perfect latency, measure an idle system. If you're running full out and not measuring latency, you haven't really measured what happens when you're running at that throughput, right? So measure them together and then plot different scenarios. Um, mistakes, small mistakes, small overlooks in measurement and analysis could lead to multi-order of magnitude misreporting. Hopefully you guys took that away from the coordinate emission discussion. And you know, you can use jhiccup and HDR histogram. They're both public domain code on GitHub. Well, actually, HDR histogram is on GitHub. Jhiccup is just jhiccup.org. And the last one is, you know, Zing's a cool JVM, so use it. Okay, so I think, are we at the end of the day? Does that mean we can run question if we want to, or do they need to go? <laughs> <laughs> Well, no, I'm asking if there's stuff after the talk from a scheduling perspective. Uh, uh, only perception. Um, oh, okay. Uh, Good. You know, I have two questions. Good one, uh, can you talk about uh, some of the uh, uh, system level hiccup causes? Do you have like a collection of usually fixes for the system? Um, so we've built up a lot of experience in that. Um, and some of the experiences that we it really depends on what you want to achieve and how, what level of control you can assert on your system. <clears throat> so if you're in the trading game or if you're in some real-time system game and you, the owner of the application, can basically control everything on the system, you effectively have root access, you make sure nobody else is sharing anything with you, nobody goes around and upgrades the system without asking you, that kind of stuff. Then there's a whole slew of things you could do to drop to probably below a millisecond worst case behavior on a system. And, and we have customers running at that level. I wanna make sure you guys are aware that that takes a lot of work. Uh, with Zing, you'll drop to below 10 millisecond like that if you're already in low latency games. And then you'll kind of get down to the two, three milliseconds in a week. And then at that point, you're kind of chasing maybes. Right? You see a blip and you're wondering what makes it happen and you try a bunch of things people have done before until it goes away. It's everything from CPU affinities, interrupt affinities, file cache settings, transparent huge pages on or off. There's just these, you know, we keep learning new stuff and you know, it just adds and adds and adds. That's in the low latency game. If you're in the regular enterprise game, and there are usually 20, 30 milliseconds of blip is not gonna kill you, you're okay with it. You're, you often have more running threads than CPUs. That's not a sin there. Then there's no point in dragging all the way down there because a, you know, just an oversubscribed CPU is gonna cause the same noise, so why are you wasting your time there? And at those levels, it's easier. There, there are three, four things we usually recommend. You know, turn off your swap. Turn off your transparent huge pages because they, they're great, by the way. Transparent huge pages are great, except that they'll pause your system for a second every once in a while. Like literally, random thread that happens to want 4K of memory needs to defragment all the RAM in the box. Um, so unfortunately, right now, we recommend it's always turned on, off if you care about latencies, if you want latencies below one second outliers. Um, other tricks around, uh, 
VM min free for the file cache are very common, so we have a bunch of those. And um, it, those are just, you know, twist this into the good spot. And if you're in the Java world, garbage collection is probably your dominant outlier. And if you're plotting percentiles and you care about them, that's probably where you're at. Um, there are plenty of ways to understand GC. I have a 90 minute talk on that too. Um, and, and then you can try and figure out how to tune it or play with it or code to it. Or you could just decide to use Zing and stop worrying about it. Um, but, you know, there's a lot there. Talking about Zing, uh, can you say something about the open source? Um, so Zing as a product has, you know, there's some open source code in there, but it's not an open source product. It's a, it's a commercial product. You, you know, pay. Not, so we do offer it for free for open source developers. So if you guys are working on an open source project and you want to use Zing to develop on, to test, to do whatever it is you want there, um, we have a program that gives developers that for free. We, we want that to happen. So uh, it's good. What, what project are you involved with? Hmm? Oh, okay. Well. Yeah, we've talked to you guys. And then, um, yeah, I mean, I've talked to the Netty guys and a bunch of others, uh, Lucene guys. So we, we show some nice results, especially when, I mean, Neo4j has nice big fat heaps. So, you know, we can help with that. Um, and, you know, in-memory indexing on Lucene is amazing when you can put a 140 gig heap and stuff all of Wikipedia into it. It screams, you know, nothing on this, you know, it's great. And it doesn't pause. Um, other questions? Yeah. Is there, um, garbage collection tuning needed for that? For Zing? Yeah. yeah. I should have put up the chart that I have. I have a chart that shows all the flags you can set on hotspot and the common flags, and here's examples with 30 this and that. On Zing, you set your heap size and you're done. Um, and that is, in practice, what people do. If they're in low latency, they sometimes reduce the number of GC threads that they have because they're trying to avoid CPU contention at uh, sub you know, 10 millisecond levels. But that's it. And the, the other part is our number one tuning parameter for Zing is heap. Um, we like empty memory. We double our efficiency for every doubling of empty memory. So it, you know, it, we can keep the system pauseless up to a certain throughput. And if you want to double the throughput at which we do that, just double the empty memory you give us. And there's no limit to how much you can give us as long as it's in the box. So you could go wild. Usually the way we start pilots is we'll say, just let's set a 40 gig heap. I don't care what you're using. Let's set a 40 gig heap as long as you know, you're using less than that. And once we get it working, we can figure out what you really need. Maybe it's 20, maybe it's 10, maybe it's five. We'll drop it in half until it breaks, back up by 3x, and we're done tuning. And, and that's usually the alternative to finding the right value to 15 different flags on other GBMs. So it's a very short exercise.